Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Belmont Housing Trust Public Forum, where we're going to discuss the Belmont Housing Production Plan. My name is Gabrielle Disler, and I'm the town staff planner. Uh, thank you all who are here in person and over Zoom tonight. Um, I'm going to hand uh, the mic off to our um, Housing Trust co-chairs, uh, Rachel Haller and Bessie Lipson, to officially open the meeting because this is officially a uh, Housing Trust uh, public forum. Hello, I'm Rachel Heller, co-chair of the Housing Trust, and I call this meeting to order. Um, I'm joined tonight by co-chair Betsy Lipson and some of our Housing Trust members, Judy Fines, uh, Mark Kagan, Madeline Fraser-Cook, Tommy Olson, Michael Murata, Benny Meshlam, and ex-officio members Gloria Leipzig and Thayer Donham. Um, so welcome to Belmont's Housing Trust community discussion, Building Belmont's Future. Tonight is the second community discussion that we have had as part of the process of developing Belmont's housing production plan. At our last meeting, we shared a lot of data. It was a lot of data and a lot of just absorbing information. Tonight is much more hearing from you uh, about sites and opportunities in town. Before we get started, I'll begin by thanking our partners, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, MAPC, You'll see them a lot in town as they're helping us in the housing production plan and also with our MBTA communities, multifamily zoning, and Metro West Collaborative Development. Thank you also to the Belmont Media Center for broadcasting our meeting. And thank you to Gabe Disler, staff planner for the town of Belmont for all the support you're providing to the housing trust, the housing production plan, and everything else in town. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, tonight. We are going to start with a presentation on the housing production plan. We will then break out into small groups uh, to discuss uh, potential locations for more homes. As, welcome, as well, you're welcome, as well as the kinds of housing uh, types that would fit our community and meet the different needs that people have in town. We will then come back together for a group discussion before we wrap it up for the night. Before we dive into the, um, the uh, details about the night and the presentation, um, I just want to talk about why we do a housing production plan. Um, housing production plans really provide us the opportunity to understand the needs that we have in town and identify the opportunities and how we'll move forward on meeting those needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Belmont is a great place, right? We all love living here. We have a wonderful community. We have great local businesses. We have beautiful conservation land. Uh, we have access to multiple job centers. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> and um, we have access to multiple forms of public transportation. Um, so we know that this is a wonderful community. Now, to preserve what it is that, sorry, that we love, we need to provide housing that meets people's needs in our community. So when we have homes that people can afford, it means that kids can live near their grandparents, our restaurants and our shops have employees. It means entrepreneurs can take chances. It means that young families can actually get a start um, on being part of the community and, and setting their roots. Um, and it means that college grads can come home, that, that there's a place that they can afford in their community. Next slide, please. I think we're on slide four, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so our housing production plan provides us with a framework to meet our local housing needs, proactively influence development in town, comply with the state's affordable housing law, chapter 40B, and it can make us eligible for grants from the state like housing choice grants. When we know what kind of housing it is that we need, we can design policies like zoning that help to create that housing, um, when we know what kind of housing we need, we can communicate our priorities to developers when they come with ideas for what they'd like to build in town. When we know what kind of housing we need, we can foster housing development in the areas that we choose rather than having developers determine where they will build the housing in our town. So as you may know, under the state's affordable housing law, when we produce homes that are affordable, 10% of our homes are affordable, uh, to people with moderate incomes, we can then, when we get to that 10% benchmark, we then have more of a say in what kind of development we see in our town. 
um, when we know what kind of housing we need, we can seek out state grants, like the Housing Choice Grants, and other grants that help us with infrastructure in our community and other ways to benefit our community. And when we know what kind of housing we need and we allow it, we can be a healthy, vibrant community that's inclusive, that's welcoming, and where people across income levels can live. Next slide. Sorry, it's hard to see the slides, the microphone, all the things. Okay, so Belmont's current housing production plan, you can see uh, it covered the years from 2018 to 2023. So our current plan expires um, in May of 2023. Um, the housing production plan, we created it in 2018, just so you understand the process and we'll go, what we'll go through this time. Once we develop it and produce it and have a report ready to go, it needs to be approved by the planning board, the select board, and the state's Department of Housing and Community Development. So our plan is to have this housing production plan ready for May 2023 when our current housing production plan expires. Um, to get to that, we've been working with MAPC and Metro West Collaborative Development on a comprehensive needs assessment and public outreach that has included focus groups, these community meetings, and also surveys. Tonight, you can see the kind of today you are here, uh, we will discuss potential sites in town for more homes um, and also the kinds of housing types. We'll then develop recommendations. We'll hold another community meeting where we get more feedback to make sure that we are really reflecting what it is that we're hearing and the kinds of needs and really addressing uh, what, you know, the, the needs that we have for more homes. And then we'll bring it to the planning board and to the select board for their approval and then go to the state's Department of Housing and Community Development. Next slide, please. So the state's affordable housing law, Chapter 40B, requires that 10% of our homes are affordable to people with moderate incomes. Um, and these are homes that have rents or home prices that are considered affordable for people who are at 80% of the area median income or below. The affordable homes in these developments remain affordable even when the market rate homes increase in their prices and rents. While 80% of the area median income may seem high, um, it's important to note how affordable housing works that the rents and the home prices, they all need to work together to support the development. So that's why if there's no financial incentive going in there, you know, that the state, the town isn't putting money into it, you have to make the numbers work, be able to pay the property taxes, be able to pay the mortgage, the upkeep of the building. And that's why, you know, the affordable and the market rents really work together. And you can't go too low um, without, you know, and make those numbers work. Um, so, Belmont has currently 10,882 homes. That means we need 1,088 homes that can be counted on the state's subsidized housing inventory, or SHI. That is the, what actually counts, how we track, um, you know, if we're hitting that state benchmark of 10%. Um, so it's important to note how those numbers actually work. Um, so when rental developments are created through Chapter 40B, you'll learn that 20 to 25% are affordable, but the whole development will count. So an example is when the homes at McLean are created, there's 110 apartments. 25% will be affordable, all 110 will count. And this is because of the great need in the state to create more rental and more multifamily rentals. So that's an incentive to help communities really get to that benchmark and produce the mixed income homes that we need. On the homeownership side, it's only the affordable homeownership um, opportunities that get counted on the subsidized housing inventory. Um, so Belmont currently has 673 homes on the state on the subsidized housing inventory, or the SHI. When the new homes at McLean are added, along with the two affordable homes that are coming uh, with the development in Waverly Square, the new mixed-use building. Um, that will add 118 more homes to Belmont's count, bringing us to 891 homes on the subsidized housing inventory, or 8.2%. And that is almost double where we were a few years ago. So really a big round of applause to Belmont because a lot is happening and we are making progress. Um, by adding 100 and, um, actually, sorry, just to back up a little bit, when we do that, we will actually, so when we add those homes and get ourselves to 8%, we will have made progress on the housing production plan 
And that means that we will have one to two years of what's called a safe harbor. That essentially means even though we haven't hit the 10% benchmark, we can still say no to developments that don't meet our goals because we have shown the state that we're making progress and we're producing homes. When we get to 10%, that's when it's not a one to two year safe harbor, but we've achieved a safe harbor and can continue. It doesn't mean we're done with affordable housing. It just means we just have more decision-making authority um, on the kinds of development that happens. Um, next slide, please. So how do we create a plan to reach the 10% benchmark and add 197 homes that are largely in mixed income communities, because remember we said it was a mix of the affordable and the market rate working together, and that allows us to meet multiple needs in town. Next slide, please. We have three strategies to do this. <laughs> we have zoning, we have funding, and identifying actual sites where we can do this. Next slide, please. So zoning is the set of rules that determines what can and cannot be built. Um, many of the neighborhoods that we love actually could not be built under current zoning. So I live in Waverly Square, lots of two families. You actually could not redo that today um, it, without a lengthy process uh, for, of approvals. So it's important to note that even what we see around us can't necessarily be rebuilt, and that's why zoning is so important to put in the rules that allow that development to happen. Um, establishing zoning that allows the homes that we need is really critical to producing the homes. You can't build what's not allowed. Um, so we will have an opportunity to do a lot of work on zoning this year. Um, you may have heard if you were at town meeting last night about the state's MBTA communities law, which is requiring all communities that, have, that are served by the MBTA uh, to create zones uh, for multifamily housing. So that is an opportunity uh, here in town to meet multiple needs through zoning, including affordable housing. And that needs to be around transit, it can be in our commercial centers and main streets. So it's important to keep in mind when we're going through this process tonight about where would we like to see more affordable housing because there's obviously potential coming together of where we'd like to see it and where we, can, where we have a great opportunity to zone for it. Um, zoning can also allow for other types of homes that are affordable. Uh, this isn't just about apartment buildings, the housing production plan, that's really the way that we'll get to the numbers. But having a diversity of housing types, if we had accessory dwelling units that were easier to build, where there's a smaller home that's either part of the main house on a property or somewhere on the property, that's another way just to diversify our housing stock and create more opportunities that can be affordable to people at different incomes. Um, and also, one more thing about through uh, zoning. Through zoning, we can strengthen our inclusionary zoning. Um, we have a good policy that requires a percentage of homes be affordable when new development comes. There's always more that we can do uh, to strengthen the policy and make it easier to produce the affordable homes that we'd like to see. Next slide, please. Next is funding. Uh, we have the Community Preservation Act and also home funds. Um, CPA, I would just like to thank the town um, for approving the um, $250,000 to the housing trust. That enables the housing trust to put money out there to incentivize developers to leverage other state funds and create more affordable housing in town. This is an important tool. CPA can help us to create more affordable housing. When I talked about how market rate and affordable rents work together, you can do you know, a, a like middle income homes or moderate income homes when you don't put money into it. If we actually have money that we can put into these mixed income developments, now we can get more affordable homes, we can get more deeply affordable homes that lower the rents and home prices for people with low incomes. So CPA is an important tool. Home funds are federal funds that go through a consortium that Belmont is part of. Um, we've used our home funds to help with our public housing stock and we can also use it for more development in town. Um, so these funds are really important just for going deeper in terms of affordability, getting lower rents, but also potentially more, more homes. Next slide. Identifying sites. Where are we going to put these new homes? Where would we, where would we like to see them? Um, tonight we are going to spend time identifying locations in town. Think about the different parts in our town that could benefit from more homes. You know, again, with the multifamily zoning through the MBTA communities law, 
that is zoning that will put in place near transit, near commercial centers, near businesses. Are those good places for housing? Let's think about where we need more affordable housing. Um, so tonight we'll walk through and, and really talk uh, as a group and, and in small groups about where these sites can be. Um, when we have sites, that's when we can promote these sites to developers. Again, we're determining where we would like to see more homes built. If we do that, again, we're more in control of the process and it's helping us to meet multiple goals in town rather than having someone come and say, well, here's my opportunity, I'll go for it over here. Um, and as uh, on the, the last bullet on the slide, pursue friendly 40B developments. These are de the, that term friendly 40B means that the town works with the developer throughout the process to design it. So that's how the new development at McLean was designed. Um, the developer came with one proposal. The town said, actually, we have other goals in town and we were able to work together to design something that means that 25% of those homes will be affordable. Um, so it's you know, being able to work with developers to meet our goals. Now I will turn it over to Betsy. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm Betsy Lipson, co-chair of the Housing Trust and um, following that technical presentation, um, I will actually make it much easier for you. We're just gonna slide into the part that you came here for. You came here to help identify opportunity sites. Um, so there are a couple of ways we're gonna go about this. And we just wanted to ground everybody in common language when we talk about housing types. Um, I have family in the Washington DC area. Whenever I say two family or a three family, people look at me you know, like, what are you talking about? That's not a term that's used in that part of the country. So that's the purpose of the, um, what you see up here, the definitions, people on Zoom. You'll see um, uh, your slide during the breakout will have definitions associated with pictures, and I thought we would just go through it here. Next slide. So what you have on this slide are six different examples, um, and these are the terms that we want you to think about when you're talking about um, the type of housing you could imagine at a specific site when it comes to the, the discussion point. So at townhome, Typically a townhome up in the top left corner might be the type of thing where um, there are two floors to an apartment building that, or condo that shares a common wall with its neighbor. Um, sometimes they're stacked, so the lower level is one unit and the upper level is another unit. So that's townhomes. They're very often less than 10 or 12 in a block of one townhome uh, group. Then moving down, Small multifamily, that's what we would typically say is a two or a three family or even a four if you um, go broader with the cut or smaller. So the idea with that design was just to say sometimes they look different than our conventional two family or three family. That um, picture I think is from Cambridge, no surprise, right? Um, getting a little modern there. Um, down in the lower corner is three to four story multifamily. So you can, st you can start to picture what that looks like. We're now talking about s maybe 16 to 25 units in a building. Um, the lower level on that three to four story multifamily um, does not have retail. So that's a different, um, that's mixed use in the top right corner. So mixed use is a term we're hearing a lot now. The idea there is that you'd have housing on the upper floors and retail or offices on the first floor. And no surprise, uh, going back generations and centuries, that's how it used to be. You'd always have the people who owned the store would live above the store. So it's this idea of creating a walkable um, community. It's very um, positive for the climate because fewer people have to hop in a car to go do errands and um, it cr creates vibrancy where you have people who live there, you know, frequent the cafes, that sort of thing. I think a good example of mixed use that we might all see on a regular basis is um, the new construction in Waverly um, that has office space or retail space. Nothing is yet occupied, I think. Something's coming. Um, so that's a nice example to keep in mind when you think of mixed use. Um, accessory dwelling units, um, you know, that's a common um, thing in the news right now. We're hearing a lot about ADUs. And I think what's often pictured are these really cute cottages in a backyard that everybody wants to live in. But I think it's more common to have basement ADUs. Um, I grew up with that, my parents had one. Um, and so that's what that picture is, just to say, a lot of people have the height, have the space to convert their basement into a separate apartment. That's why that's listed there. It can be multiple kinds. It can be in the backyard. It can be above a garage. Um, it can be in a basement, that sort of thing. Um, 
cottage style cluster is the bottom right corner. The word cluster is not there, but the concept is um, small um, cottages is a cute little term from a realtor probably um, that would be, you know, one bedroom um, and usually one level um, and clusters. So it creates a little nook and a sense of a neighborhood there. Next slide, please. Um, this is from Newton, but if you could just, you know, replace it with the, um, the Bradford in Cushing Square. That's what we have there. Um, Bradford is 112 units and has um, retail on the lower floor um, and parking down below. So large mixed use is another housing type to hold in your head as you start to get into the conversation with others about opportunity sites and what you could imagine going there. Next slide. So now we're just gonna talk a little bit about some of the images that are around here and again that folks on Zoom will also see. So it's specific sites that you think are prime for development, uh, redevelopment, preservation, or new housing. Um, so I just wanna preface all this by saying that there are some pictures here of privately owned property. And it's important to remember the owner of that property may to decide to do whatever she wants or he wants with that property. We're just raising it here for discussion because it's a, it's a parcel of land that may not be zoned for the owner to maximize development on it. It's a large parcel of land. So I just wanna say, if you see an image here and you recognize that that's privately owned, just know that we don't have rights for that. We're just raising ideas here. That's all it is. Next slide. So, a uh, familiar picture here, Trapello Road Corridor. Um, I think it's important just to note um, a lot of the retail along the Trapello Road is one level retail. So, you know, when you drive down there, walk down there, bike down there, do you imagine, well, what would it look like if we had housing above some of this? Um, and as you can see in some of the pictures, there are some nearby two and three story, story buildings um, in the background. And that's because previous zoning did allow for that. And Rachel referred to that earlier, that we do have some areas in town that have two family or three family or multi-level that you couldn't replace now because the zoning doesn't allow for it. Next slide. Okay, so this is just to say, well, what would happen if we did something like this along the Trapello Corridor? Now that's an image from Northampton, Massachusetts. It doesn't have a Trapello kind of road right in front of it, but it starts to give you an idea um, of buildings that still have a sense of architectural um, historical leaning. You know, it doesn't all have to look new and modern. It's just a, a housing type that provides for a lot of units and um, could fit a long Trapello corridor. Just an idea to get your juices going. Next slide. There's this, a large parking lot at Beach and Lexington Streets. So just to give you orientation, um, move yourself towards Waverly. It's right up the road from Butler School. Um, again, this is like privately owned. It's owned by the Archdiocese. It is a rare um, one acre undeveloped lot. It is not heavily used during the week. Um, and um, you know, it has great potential because it is nearby a, a business district, it's nearby a school, and um, there's a lot of things that one might wanna do on that spot. Um, so just to get you thinking, um, next slide. Moraine Street is in the similar neighborhood. Moraine Street is down by Waverly. The picture you see is of a privately owned lot. Um, the housing trust um, was for a little while in conversation with representative of the, um, the owner, and. Uh, representative to the owner, yeah. And um, there was some interest in um, doing more with the lot. Um, I think the challenge there is it's not zoned for the doing more part. Um, so there was a lot of um, buildup of excitement, but the reality was it would take a lot of work to zone for this. So we just wanted to present here, hey, there's a lot of space. And in um, sketches done by the housing trust, we realized that there's a potential for up to 40 units on that spot that could aesthetically still fit in with the street. It's not like jamming in a bunch of units. It would fit nicely. Next slide. And then uh, lovely Belmont Center with um, pictures that don't show off that it's a gem of a spot. Um, but the parking lot there um, is large and um, there might be opportunity with um, a well-developed well design to have housing that could bring in a lot of foot traffic for the businesses right there. 
Um, so you might think about um, an apartment building there that still allowed for parking down below, and it was raised up. Next slide. And Sherman Gardens, we do have a representative here from the Belmont Housing Authority, and I want to just take this moment to help people distinguish that the um, Housing Trust is a different entity from the Housing Authority. The Housing Authority is responsible for public housing um, in town, and so the Belmont Housing Authority has been really proactive about seeking funding to redevelop um, this site, Sherman Gardens, and there's a plan in place for this. Um, it's really exciting because it is desperately needed, and also will yield more units than exist there. Um, and those units, of course, will count on our um, subsidized housing inventory because they will be affordable. Next slide. Okay, it's time. This is what you came for. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do is, um, the Zoom folks, there will be an automatic um, break. You will be put into groups. You won't have to do anything. Um, and here we will break into groups, small groups to discuss. Um, next slide. So the conversation is just what we've been talking about. There's no surprises. Um, you are going to um, talk through different um, spots in town. You're gonna to talk about the kind of housing you could imagine supporting there. And I'm just gonna put a supporting there because it's all preliminary. We are just trying to generate ideas. But I will say, you have to remember down the line, one of the most difficult things with housing development is the lack of support that ends up happening. So, you know, really try to put yourself in the position of, oh, five years from now, if something like this were being proposed, I could support it. I'd like to support it. So that's the idea there. Um, and you're just going to run through a bunch of these um, sites that we um, put up. You're going to come up with your own ideas, which I think a lot of people have. You're going to share housing types that you're interested in. If you're aware of the zoning changes that might be needed, then go ahead and talk about that, or maybe you'll learn from... Um, others who are here, what zoning changes are needed. And um, I will say the folks um, who are facilitating the Zoom breakout are gonna be taking notes and then we'll be doing a report out to the larger group after. So Judy, we think we gave ourselves five minutes. So five minutes, so I think we're gonna be able to do this for 25 minutes. Um, great, so I think Mark, you're gonna be running the Zoom breakout. So I think we can break that part right now. Good. Great, thank you. Well, there was a lot of good conversation going on in this room. It sounds like there was a lot happening on Zoom too. Um, rather than have each group do a report, what we thought is that we do a little bit more popcorn style and just take each location that we discussed and then have time at the end to just open it up and what were the other ideas. Um, so the, one of the uh, sites we talked about is the Trapello Road Corridor. What kind of feedback came back? What kind of ideas? Any, would anyone like to say some of the things that came up in their group? We can start in the room, then we'll go to Zoom. Gloria. Oh, sorry. In the room, Gabe needs to bring you the mic. Uh, one of the things we talked about was if there is more development above the current retail, that, that we may need to change zoning laws regarding parking so that you know, because right now there's no overnight parking, we wouldn't need to make some amendments to that so that people could have cars and still um, so much and, and live above those retail spots. So excellent. So changes in parking um, to allow for development apartments above the um, above the stores on Trapello. Do Were there other there. anything else come up around Trapello? Yes. Yeah, there was some some um, there was interest in it because the current stores aren't that lovely, um, but there was concern because the De Stefano building is largely empty on the first floor, and something is coming in the summer. Something is coming. Okay, <laughs> but there was also the same concern about about parking. Yeah, in our Zoom break, uh, this is this is Ian jumping in here just to say everything yeah. that other people said and some sensitivity to going as high as three stories that that might start to um, really oppress some of the neighbors and the Butler School, depending on where it's at, but that there were some areas, specifically the Bradford and Winters Hardware that seemed right for some development. Excellent, thank you. 
Uh, are there more? Yes. Go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Let me hand you a mic. All right. There was there was a lot of support for mixed use, but also um, multifamily, small, three and four story buildings. Um, because actually, Trapello Road, as a whole, is a very spread out commercial district. Um, needs to be maybe there should probably be more of a specific commercial center instead of one very long strip mall as it was described and um so that's why there was also a lot of support with with multi-story buildings but without the retail component interesting okay yes we have more over here yes and then i'm going to come right back to zoom yeah i think one difference between belmont center for example and uh Trapello road is that a lot of the properties are owned by individuals. So to do a block, to, to have a, an architecturally attractive vision for a, for a whole block, you would have to overcome the, uh, uh, you know, the disparate ownership of the maybe five, six, seven different buildings that are, that are making it up right now. So, we, so thinking about how to incentivize that or to create a structure for that, uh, where people could either get bought out or be a participant on the other end, something like that, you know, being realistic about it. The, the, the other thing is, of course, we, you know, we're moving towards buying more and more stuff online and away from, so uh, buying stuff in stores. Um, so maybe we should be realistic about the degree, the amount of um, apartment over retail that can be supported, to, you know, I think people were already getting at that with saying, well, a lot of the existing space is, is uh, for example, in Cushing Square is unoccupied. So, so that would argue for more, you know, a mix of townhouses and uh, dwelling units over retail. Thank you. Our friends on Zoom, do we have some more from the groups that are joining us on Zoom? Amy has a, Amy Kirsch has a great hand. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I think there's a part of us that has to get over the fear of going vertical, because I think that's the only way we're going to be able to build the units that we really need to build. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we could bring in either multi use or parking at the bottom and throw in three or four floors and actually get enough units to satisfy the requirements for this. I also think that our zoning does need to be relaxed. Um, but Trapello Road seems a perfect spot because a lot of the businesses are single level. There's not enough parking for them to really be frequented the way that they need to be frequented. We've lost some going to nonprofits at this point, and we need to keep our businesses thriving, which means they need more people to frequent them. So it could be a win-win to put it there. Um, so that's my vote. Helpful, thank you. Are there more um, comments on Zoom? Right now. Okay, anybody else in the room on Trapello? Okay, we'll move on to the parking lot at Beach and Lexington. Some people know it well, other people don't, may not have seen it. Any thoughts? It's okay if nothing came up. Maybe this will create a spot for you to go walk by in town and see <laughs> what it looks like. Okay, yeah. oh, we got one. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, Hold on. We'll come to Zoom. Sorry, I missed that. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just, We're going to, yep, just Vincent one, and then. Yeah, just one sentence. It would be an opportunity to create a building that was sympathetic to, that harmonized with the, the, the church and, and uh, buildings that are around it. And, you know, it would be wonderful if we could think that way uh, about how the housing would, should look different in different parts of Belmont. Right, in different housing types. There actually is an apartment building um, next to it as well. Um, on Zoom, sorry about that. Ann Man. Hi, Ann. Hi. So that's a fantastic location. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't recognize who was just speaking, but it's true. We have um, non-tax paying entities that are right next to it. So, and I, I don't, 
the development of these have been very attractive. They do end up looking quite a bit like the Bradford. They have a tendency to actually increase the value of the properties around them. It's a it's a huge amount of space. And um, I'm, I'm not sure what the proximity to the MBTA needs to be. It is just right up the street. But um, I, I don't imagine that a three and a half, four story building that housed maybe 50 families would be too much of a burden there. And a quick comment so people understand the zoning for the MBTA communities. Um, Belmont is required to allow for 1,632 homes. It can be on at least 27 acres. So we could do a lot of homes in a small area, or there could be 14 acres that are within half a mile of one of our commuter rail stations. And the rest can actually be spread out in other areas through town. Um, that are at least in five acre increments so you can actually, you know, create some housing. So just if that's helpful when you think through, go ahead. There was some interest in our group, um, either, either here or on the Moraine Street of creating community using cluster development for a variety of, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, different size units. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Did you have something, Gloria? I guess our, our group was similar to what Helen was talking about, similar things to what Helen was just saying. Uh, look, is that one not working? Or is it working? Maybe it's, it's, really it's on. Fun. It's on. Really okay. Uh, we talked about a mix of housing there, including uh, cluster and townhomes. And uh, again, just to try and fit into the neighborhood a little bit better. Uh, and I, I liked the other idea about of replicating the ideas of what the, the church buildings look like. Uh, and I think that could be done on this. I, again, I think it's a large site and it could hold a lot of, of homes there. Exciting. Are there more? Oh, sorry, Stephanie. And then we'll go back to Zoom. All right. Um, there was some concern in my group about how the town could actually maybe get the parking lot to work with, but um, that aside, there was definitely support for small multifamily houses and townhomes. Um, also possibly a great spot for um, underground parking or a podium parking type situation. But again, echoing what someone said earlier about um, harmonizing with the other residences in that area. Helpful. Is there more in our Zoom room? No. Um, okay. In oh, go ahead. Oh, hi, um, just uh, in our Zoom room, um, we actually had a, a conversation that was a little bit removed from the individual parcels. I think that there was, um, there were comments on, you know, we need something different. We did different styles in different places. We want variety, we want density, but we didn't zone in on each of the, the sites. What we did talk about was the importance of kind of the Trapello corridor going back to some of these commercial areas and getting foot traffic along them. Um, that some of them look very sleepy um, was the, the adjective, which I think is a good one in some of these spots and that um, people uh, need to be around to, to support these businesses, need to bring the housing units to satisfy the commercial activity that's needed. Um, and then, um, well, we'll save the other the other comments um, for when we get to the other types of parcels. But I just wanted to say that um, at least for the first two, there's a general feeling that that we need variety, and um, there's opportunity for that variety and density. Helpful, thank you. Um, and, and just to stack yeah. on Madeline's comment, having having first floor be businesses that 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 could create employment for the people that are living in affordable housing, because we've seen so many help wanted signs in the Belmont storefronts that this feels like a win-win. Excellent, helpful, thank you. Um, moving on just because of the tightness of time, the Belmont Center parking lot. Are there some thoughts, visions, both on Zoom in the room? Oh, we already have somebody in the room. Yes. Yes, um, our group was very mixed on this. Um, it, some people felt like leave it alone. It doesn't. It will. It it will create a larger need for parking. And um, other people felt it was an ideal site um, for just part of the parking lot, not the entire parking lot, um, for 
either what it's for. For mixed use um, and, and apartments above stores um, in the main area, as well as the whatever it's called, podium parking. But it, it was really a, a mixed a mixed reception to this idea. Okay. Um, anybody in the Zoom room? Heather, go ahead. Uh, Sorry, someone else? Yeah. Because of can't raise. Uh, I do. Thank you. I actually, well, I, I was, um, you, you just brought it up actually, but I was going to bring up that in our uh, room, we talked about the podium parking as being a really good opportunity there. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, um, kind of raise up what Amy had said as well before thinking about the the issues with um with vertical you know growth and you know potential problems with visibility across and things like that i just feel like we need to kind of also really um let go of some of that because i think there's the the, the housing crisis is kind of trumping all of the um the issues that we might feel about a, a little bit more growth um and so yeah it might really i think be great there and just while we're talking about belmont center i also want to just sneak in the fact that, um, and I'm not sure if somebody brought it up already, but we talked in our breakout room also about how the lack of incentivizing commercial, um, you know, uh, com uh, commercial uh, revenue in Belmont seems to be a really big obstacle to any kind of housing affordability, right? We're not getting the revenue from that. Um, uh, businesses are paying really, really high rents. And so if we can just incentivize more businesses, I think we can solve a lot of these problems just by doing that. Um, and also that le leads to better mixed mixed housing opportunities because now we've got thriving businesses underneath these um, these apartment buildings and, and, and homes. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely helpful to think about how multiple multiple things can come together, multiple goals in town. Yes, Vince. Uh, although this is a, a blue sky exercise, I think we have to be uh, realistic about the fact that the town owns some parcels and therefore the possibility of, of moving ahead with speed exists, whereas some piece of land you don't own and might be extremely expensive, it's kind of theoretical. And obviously the Claflin lot falls into that first category. And so it, it should be uh, prioritized. The, there would be a revolution if you tried to take away parking spots. So it's an absolute, I mean, the, the merchants would, would uh, uh, you know, go nuts. So uh, that that's a, a necessity that the parking be preserved, whether that's down under or this this podium style, which has the disadvantage of not of not creating an interesting streetscape for people who for, for pedestrians. Um, you know, but the advantage that it's cheap, a cheaper way to to preserve the parking. But but it, anyway, I think it has to be prioritized for that reason. And I I would just quickly add that I think there's also an opportunity at the former Belmont Municipal Light Department building next to the police station. We're, we're, just like the police station was dramatically augmented by pushing back towards the tracks, the same thing could be done, basically just keep the facade and got the rest or tear down the rest of the building. Also of note, the town owns all of the land on the north side of the train platform, all the way down to Leonard Street, the strip owned by the MBTA is actually relative. It's just a paved area, okay. so there's an opportunity to extend or add uh, onto that building, um, going towards Leonard Street. So that, that could be a bigger project than it might at first look. Great. So hearing some reuse, different parking roles in different parts of town, different types of housing, fostering the commercial space and supporting our businesses. Um, Moraine Street, which also many of you know, brings up another connection to town goals, access to community path. Um, so was there any discussion about Moraine Street? And on Zoom as well, I don't mean to leave you out of I'll question. jump in on, uh, on the Moraine Street. We, we had a lot of agreement on uh, Belmont Center too, just to say people were, were in complete consensus on getting 60 plus units going there with parking underneath and the added idea of subsidizing train passes to help reduce the number of individual cars mm -hmm. that people felt the need to own there. But, uh, but going to Moraine Street, uh, that one maybe took the day. I don't know if there was consensus on it, but we had a proposal for 100 units. 
That was the, the member of the housing trust that some surrendering. <laughs> he didn't quite get that high, but I love it. I love the idea. This is great. And no, that was me who said we could put 100 units only because I, uh, I'm across the street where I had a listing and I look at the, 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 how big our units are. And if they were the same size as what we have over at Sherman Gardens, which is the Belmont Housing Authority, it's, he doesn't just own that whole uh, auto body shop. He owns the properties that are on the street as well. So it's, it's a long block and looking at what Cambridge has been able to do with the same size space. If we could go three and a half, four stories, we could do it. Helpful. Are there more thoughts? Yes. Um, our group had a discussion about the um, ADUs, uh, recognizing that there was going to be a need to be some kind of method that there was a uh, credit that we get credit from the state. You know, whether it's are you talking about counting towards the subsidized housing inventory? Yeah, yeah, and putting it uh, whatever. If it was, <laughs> what was deed, that? Uh, paying attention to the deed of the house and if that rental was going to stay with with it, an affordable rental was going to stay with the deed or was it going to be just as long as it's rented and that's a whole nother side of the administration of it but adus was an interest in our group excellent thank you we don't have time to get into all the details around that but perhaps we can have a follow-up because i think there's a lot there to, <laughs> to discuss we only have eight minutes left so i want to make sure that we get to more ideas that came from each of you, because we just had a couple of sites. You might have a lot more in mind. Um, we very, very, very briefly uh, just talked about Concord Avenue from the post office down to the gas station is a wasteland. I mean, it's got that wonderful new Armenian what's it's, but other than that, there's this mishmash and and we've never really looked at it for uh, mixed use or town homes or I, I don't think i'm not sure you want something real high density but I, I, ian you may have more to say because this was your dream site and we love all of our buildings in town we can enhance them <laughs> <laughs> thanks helen uh, yeah my observation being a commuter rail rider for the past 20 years there's a lot of empty space behind those square brick buildings uh, for parking which is empty there's also adequate parking on the sides of those buildings that is not fully used the parking in front of those buildings i do see cars there but anyway i i was wondering if there could be more of a, a consistent office retail housing complex there, which is across from, yeah, Powers and the, the library site. Right, and right near the commuter rail, the bike path, all the high school, yeah, that's a good point. Yes, Vincent, and then, sorry, we'll go over to Elisa, and then we'll see you online. Yeah, in terms of underutilized, uh, you know, or poorly developed part of Belmont, I would argue that Brighton Street, about a block, either side, maybe two blocks either side of the intersection with the Fitchburg line, absolutely qualified. Right, so like where the um, uh, Camellas just moved, where the loading dock was, that kind of area, Crate Escape, there's some businesses over there. Is that where the area you're talking about? Exactly. Hill yeah. Estates. Right, and, and so it's nice to have a dog kennel uh, in Belmont, but but <laughs> please, that, that is- With more thing. homes, you could have more dogs for the dog, uh, doggy daycare. Well, yeah, well, or, I mean, I'm just say, suggesting that that building is underutilized the other part of the building that's utilized by Cambridge a uh, pure coat north formerly Cambridge plating has been a uh, sore point for the neighborhood for decades so I, I know one member of the select board has been interested in that parcel for a long time I think that 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 parcel and on the other side of the street there are there are buildings that are have not been inhabited for years so I think that again a whole a holistic approach could be more than the sum of the parts. The problem is those property, those parcels are owned by multiple individuals. How do we get from that current ownership structure to a larger uh, vision and, and make it work economically for everybody who's involved? Got it, thank you. Elisa, and then we need to go to Zoom, and then I will try to wrap this up in a few minutes. Elisa, Elisa. 
going to. In our group, an un, um, another potential site for sort of um, commercial on the bottom and housing up top was on the corner of Concord and Blanchard, where there's a, a like little like indigo fire is in that area. So there's thoughts of why not put housing above those stores. Got it. Okay. Zoom. What ideas do you have? Our wonderful neighbors on Zoom. Uh so Zoom, I'll, I'll jump in again and say Zoom, we got a strong advocacy for Sherman Gardens, 65 units with an invitation to section eight with that, bringing in solar to leverage and, and, uh, and electric heat pumps and the like to leverage federal and state funding, all of that. And the point was made that this is a great location for people who need to take the first train in the morning. So that was the, uh, the insight. I have, I have a quick question. That could we, who owns the space where the gazebo is on the Belmont Green? The church. Next to the church, the church, right on Concord Avenue, the corner of Concord going up to Common. Who owns that? Is that town property? The gazebo's on yeah. town property. Where the gazebo is. Yay! The gazebo is on town property. Doesn't that seem like an ideal spot? That's okay. All ideas are welcome now. We're not in the no phase. This is a brainstorm. <laughs> I like where your head is at. I went okay. into the other category. <laughs> what was that? Was there another one? Uh, the other idea is there's this parking lot across the street from Lone Tree Hill next to the Star Market. And I feel like it's typically empty. There's a lot of buses there, but it's not like a big frequented area. So that could be a possibility. Right on Pleasant we, Street. Okay, right. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Are we there... talked about Pleasant Street um, and not really for the end of Pleasant Street by Star Market, but not for housing. But if we had more dense commercial uh, usage there and walkable, more walkable, that that might be a way to do. Again, we talked about the lack of commercial income that is preventing us from getting more, you know, housing and whatnot, that, that that would be an idea to try and get more commercial properties there. Excellent. So many connections between schools, I mean, between uh, houses and businesses. Um, are there more ideas from everyone on Zoom? I don't want to shortchange. Very quickly, I, I just had one more quick one about um, where there's already businesses, and that's the, maybe it's been talked but already um, the corner of, of uh, Pleasant and Brighton, I think it is, where the um, there's like a rug uh, rug store and, and there's a Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin Donuts. The that area. Yeah, exactly. So it just seems like that might be a good opportunity for some, um, you know, multi-story, um, maybe mixed use. I think that's technically Cambridge, isn't it? Oh, is that Cambridge? No, no. no it's, it's still okay. Belmont. That's, yeah. that's still very Belmont. much Belmont. Okay. Yeah, there's a Habitat house right there. Belmont. Right. right, right. Okay, any final comments at this point? They're not final because we still have more work to do over the next several months. Any more ideas quickly from those on Zoom so we can wrap up and get you all to relax for the evening? Sorry, do there's another really comment in the room. Zoom and then the room. Is there something else on Zoom? Um, so I just wanted to mention that we did talk about um, ADUs and the importance of figuring out the zoning for them. Um, so again, not a particular our site, but the type of building um, and um, just reinforcing the previous conversation around ADUs. Hopeful, thank you. Was it, yeah. oh, sorry, there's another comment right here, yeah. I, I mean, I'm obviously not a facilitator, but uh, a couple ideas just occurred to me. Um, on top of the Chase Bank in that parking lot on the corner. Right in the center, are yes. you talking about? Yep. Yes, yeah. so, you know, build over it. And then the the biz, the little tiny strip that used to be like the music association where oh, the oh, concord yeah. across cleaner, from the high school. Right, right. The dry cleaner is there's like a, a strip mall there. Not there's the, a little um not the indigo store. fire, but like the older version. It's near Brighton, right? Brighton and Concord. The laundromat. It's, more, it's more, or bright, not Brighton, right. More bright like and across from Underwood Street across from the veterans memorial on the other side of the street that area could be right near the yep, near the high school the end of the high school on the yep. other side of the high yes so that's a thought and in addition to the ones that have already um 
been mentioned, but a lot of you know, I, I just wanted to add that we we didn't get to it, but in our discussion of the parking of the um, Claflin lot, one thought was to have it feel. There were two different sort of ideas. One was townhome type thing, and the other was to like make it more like these villagey kind of things. So you, with a green almost, so that you could even still have the farmers market in the in the sort of shared play space or whatever um, that the apartment surrounded. If that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you all. What I'm hearing is there's a lot of opportunity. <laughs> we have a lot of ideas that need to be explored, a lot of different housing types, thinking about how it supports economic development, our small businesses, our commercial areas in town, um, thinking about parking, different parking rules for different areas. There's a lot here to work with, and I think that's really exciting. So we, we still have a few months left in this process, and it won't be done after that. We always have more you know, more to do as a community to turn any of this into um, actual homes. Um, but as far as the housing production plan process and what we'll be doing, late February, early March, there will be a public event to bring in more input for a vision for Belmont uh, based on elements that comprise our score on AARP's livability index. And this is a measure that the state looks at for comprehensive plans, which is another kind of planning that, that we'll be doing here in town. Um, input helps to inform our housing production plan. So again, being a place where people, you know, from eight to 80 can, can live as the AARP says. Um, and then in late March, we will have a final community forum on the housing production plan with goals, needs, and strategic recommendations. Um, so there's still a lot more to come in this process. The goal, as we said, is to have this in place by May so that there is really no gap between when our current housing production plan expires and the next one starts. Um, but with that, I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming, for spending your evening with us on Zoom here in the room. Thank you so much. And there'll be many more opportunities, both on this multifamily zoning, lots to come. Thank you very much.